Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Pakis, Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs at Eastern, and I'm pleased to welcome all members of the Eastern community and our guests, particularly our community college partners on the Connecticut Health and Life Sciences Career Initiative to the first University Hour of 2016. For the past three years, Eastern has been part of the Connecticut Health and Life Sciences Career Initiative, a seven college, $12.1 million trade adjustment assistance community college and career training grant funded by the US Department of Labor. We are very appreciative for the opportunities the grant has provided to our students and to others across Connecticut as they prepare for careers in health-related fields. One of the results from this grant has been a consortium-wide partnership with the Jackson Laboratory and Genomic Medicine, benefiting both students and faculty with access to cutting-edge research. It is this partnership which allows us to welcome Dr. George Weinstock, Professor and Director of Microbial Genomics at the Jackson Laboratory for Genomic Medicine in Farmington, as the first speaker in the Jackson Labs lecture series today. Eastern is proud of being a leader in the field of science education since we first opened in 1889, and many nationally known graduates in fields of research and the medical professions. We're also excited with the success of our latest major, an interdisciplinary major in health sciences, which is going strong even though it is only in its second year. We know that Dr. Weinstock's work and his talk will be of interest to students and faculty in both of these programs. Before I turn it over to Professor Murdoch to introduce our speaker, I'd like to welcome you all to stay after our talk. We'll be adjourning to the area directly behind the theater to continue our conversation and, and enjoy light refreshments. Now I'd like to turn it over to Professor Barbara Murdoch to introduce Dr. Weinstock. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dr. Packus. Uh, I have the distinct pleasure um, and terror of trying to introduce our speaker. If you look over his CV, there's not very much that he hasn't done. Um, so I can't give you a blow by blow, but I'm gonna do my best to give you um, a broad view of what he's done. You know, he's a professor from the Jackson uh, Labs. There he's director for microbial genomics. <clears throat> and uh, they study infectious disease and microorganisms and how they shape humans in both health and disease. And in doing so, they look at the impact of uh, things like the microbiome on public health. And they do this by using advanced genomic technology. So Dr. Weinstock has um, an illustrious past. He uh, did his Bachelor of Science at the University of um, Michigan, a PhD at MIT, and his postdoctoral studies at Stanford. So you can imagine that he's put this to good use. He's published hundreds of um, journal articles in the top uh, science publications. He was one of the leaders of the Human Genome Project, which was an international effort um, to try to sequence all of the DNA in the human genome. There's approximately uh, three billion base pairs. It took about 10 years and an international effort, and it's because of the technology that we have today that we could do it um, in an afternoon that allows us to really expand um, the applications of this in uh, human health. He's had numerous awards. Uh, for example, he's been named a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement in Science. Uh, you can imagine that his opinion is highly sought after by um, scientific advisory boards, uh, funding agencies, companies and research institutions. I'll give you some examples. Uh, in 2011, he was um, on the White House briefing on microbial forensics. His scope doesn't uh, remain only in the USA. He also has um, worked outside of the USA. For example, uh, he's currently and has been for a few years on the board of directors of Genome Canada. 
Um, additionally, he has uh, contributed to an expert panel with the World Health Organization, Grand Challenges in Genomics in Public Health in Developing Countries. Here, uh, their charge was to develop policies and identify uh, research priorities where genomics could bring forth cost-effective and timely solutions to health challenges faced by developing countries. Well, you might say that um, that's really exciting, but um, really, what has he done in space? Well, he's left no stone unturned, and I know very little about this, and perhaps he'll talk to us about it in the networking afterwards, but he is on the Inspiration Mars personalized medicine team. So Inspiration Mars Foundation um, is looking to send a manned spacecraft into space, out to Mars, around Mars, and bring it back to Earth. Their timeline is to do this in 2018 because there are specific astrophysics that will allow this to happen. Um, and the whole purpose of this is to inspire uh, youth in uh, science, technology, and engineering so that they might think about what the next steps in space are. I hope you'll join me to uh, welcome Dr. Weinstock warmly, and uh, I know we all look forward to hearing your talk. Well, thanks for that very nice and thorough introduction. That's great. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, so we're just down the road in this uh, beautiful new building in Farmington, uh, the Jackson Laboratory for Genomic Medicine. I'll just say a couple of words about it. Uh, we've literally just been in the building a year or so, and most of us have moved here from other parts of the country or the world. So we're all sort of newbies to Connecticut and, and very happy to be here. Um, Jackson Laboratory is a, uh, was founded in 1929 in Bar Harbor, Maine, and it's sort of the premier uh, mammalian genetics institute in the world. Um, and one of the other things it does is it provides uh, uh, mice for research, but it has a tremendous collection of uh, many different strains, many different genetic uh, variants of mice. And so it's, it's a, just a, a national resource as well as uh, really internationally for the whole community. And you know, why do you study the mouse? Well, mainly because you're interested in the human and in medical applications. And so for, for a number of years, Jax wanted to open up another campus that would be devoted to human and medical research. And so that's what we have here in Farmington. And uh, we're, we're just delighted to be here and interacting with the academic community throughout the state. So when I was invited, uh, the, the way the topic was described to me is because I'd done things on the Human Genome Project and because there was uh, this presidential announcement a few months ago, or last year actually, about precision medicine, if I could give some kind of history about how all that came about. So I've sort of scrunched that down into the first few slides and I have something that I think will also be uh, interesting and, and even more current to everybody. I have this modest title, The Human Microbiome, A New Frontier That May Just Affect Everything. And so that's, that's I, I can promise you, you won't be the same when this is done because you'll, you'll have heard about the thing that's going to affect everything. So let's start with the Human Genome Project. So um, being part of the Human Genome Project was a great honor. This was a uh, sequencing effort to sequence the human genome, get one, uh, 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 complete description of the, you know, the instructions, the parts list for human, uh, the list of all the genes, the a actual sequence of all the letters or bases that go into the human genetic code so that you could begin to discover variants and where mutations occurred. That was the goal, is to get, get a reference. And, and that ended um, in really 2003, these are two papers that were published in 2001, which was the first draft, what we called the working draft. We weren't quite done with it yet, but there was enough information that you couldn't sit on it for another two years. Um, there was a public project uh, that the National Institutes of Health funded. That was the one I was part of, and that was our paper. And there was a private project by a company called Solera, and we were actually very worried they were gonna patent the human genome if they did it first. 
And so as we would sequence bits of it, we would release it into the public domain via the internet every day so that it was no longer patentable. It was what the lawyers called disclosed, and therefore there was no proprietary nature. And so that it was a very unusual period of time. And um, there's a lot of publicity about it. There's a number of books written about it. I, I recommend it if you want to read an absolutely unique thing. And this was really the beginning of big science in genetics and genomics and in the biological sciences. The, this project was a $300 million project. Now we can do a human gene, and it took, it took, as I said, multiple years, two huge operations to do it. Um, now we can do a better job on a human genome uh, overnight for about $1,000. It's just amazing. And that's going to be one of the messages here is that the technology has just gone wild. If you think of your cell phone, <coughs> That's a very powerful computer, and it's like the original computer was something called Univac. Some of us seniors know what that is, and maybe the junior people don't. And this was like a room full of tubes and all, all wired together into an enormous array to do computation, and now your cell phone is more powerful than that. Sequencing has, under, has undergone that same kind of change, as you'll see. So. Um, this then led to this announcement by President Obama about precision medicine, which is to take advantage of all of that genetic information that is in the sequence of the human genome to be able to tailor uh, uh, treatments, uh, lifestyle, understanding of who you are and what, you know, why you're the way you are uh, to each of us, each individually. Of course, we'd have to have our genome sequence, but as the information accumulates and genome sequencing is getting cheaper and cheaper, um, the day will come when everybody, just like you get your blood type, you'll get your genome sequence too, and that'll be something you carry with you through your life, which will inform a lot of, lot of different things. Um, pretty cool to see the President of the United States pointing at a DNA molecule. You know, that's how far we've come. So here's the, uh, this evolution of this technology that I've been talking about. This is a logarithmic scale, and um, here's when DNA sequencing was invented. And uh, by the time the Human Genome Project just started, uh, sequencing, this is the amount of sequences you can get per one sequencing instrument in a day. Um, over that 20-year period, it had you know, improved quite a bit, uh, maybe a hundredfold. Um, and we did the calculations on the back of our envelopes and decided, okay, it's time to sequence the human genome. We're, we've got enough firepower to do it. But then look what happened here. It just completely took off. This is to 2010, and this keeps going up. And um, these are the different types of sequencing. This is the original sequencing that was done. Capillary sequencing was a new type of instrument. It was actually the invention of this instrument that caused the formation of that company, Solera, and that stimulated um, everybody to try to do the human genome faster. And then there's something here which is, this is, says massively parallel sequencing. Sometimes it's referred to as next generation sequencing, and that's the thing that has just taken off and has enabled all kinds of other things. So you can see here, this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, a uh, hundred million times more powerful instruments in 2010 that we had when we started out, and that just keeps going up. So we're into the trillions of times more powerful as the instruments are. Um, and cost per, you know, sequencing a letter had to keep coming down also, otherwise it wouldn't do us that much good to be able to sequence more of it, still cost the same, that would just mean we'd need more dollars. So. Um, the, the combination of the in, in increasing efficiency of the instruments and the decreasing cost has just driven this whole field. This is the first of those next generation sequencing instruments, an instrument from a company called 454, which was in Brantford, Connecticut. Uh, it was bought by Roche a number of years ago, and um, just this year, or, or just last year, they closed it uh, because they were moving on to bigger and better things, sadly. But um, this was really a revolutionary instrument. This was the one that started that exponential curve going up. And to give a little feeling for, uh, there we go, uh, to give a little feeling for uh, what it meant, here's the instruments that we sequenced the human genome with. At, at that time, I was at the Baylor College of Medicine Human Genome Sequencing Center in Houston, which was one of the five centers that did the Human Genome Project. And these are sort of the original, this is that, that sequencing instrument 
capillary instrument that caused the project to happen, that, that allowed us to have enough. So we had 100 of these. These each cost, I don't remember what it is now, $400,000 each. So it's a, you know, tens of millions of dollars of sequencing instruments in the inventory. And that's what it took to sequence the human genome. And if you can't see the 454 instrument, it's right there. And that instrument could do the work of 200 of these. So just by getting that one little instrument, we had tripled our sequencing capacity. And that sort of the pictorial representation of what this, what this is all about. Uh, you know, we, we would just pinch ourselves. And no, we would know that any, any, you know, that year when we thought we were sequencing and doing things that we never dreamed we would do, we would know that two years later we would look back on it and it would just seem like we were prehistoric. But then two years after that, we would look back on that and think it was prehistoric. So it's just uh, a, a different kind of reality in, in the field. Okay, so armed with that sequencing instrument, that 454 sequencing instrument, um, instead of doing the project where uh, five genome centers, factories had to sequence the human genome, we felt we could sequence one genome, and so the genome we chose to sequence was the genome of Jim Watson. Some of you may have heard of Watson and Crick. They were the two people who in 1953 did the structure of DNA and sort of opened up all of genetics. Suddenly everything was revealed about how heredity worked and everything, and, and won the Nobel Prize. So Jim is the director uh, for many years of the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory on Long Island, just across the sound from us. And um, he was an appropriate first genome to do. This is the first truly personal genome where it was just one person. The Human Genome Project used bits of many genomes in order to get a reference sequence. But this was the first time we did an individuals. And we had a big event at Baylor on the day that we handed him the disk drive that had his genome sequence on it. And we had met with him before and a genetic counselor and had gone through with him all the mutations we had found in his genome. He was, he was a senior person by then, so it was too late for, for the knowledge to help him any. But nevertheless, it was a very touching moment to go through with somebody and say, you know, you have this and you have that. Um, but this was the beginning. That was in 2007. And that year, there were two other individual genomes, uh, one of an African, a Nigerian, uh, for a Yoruban tribe, and another, Craig Venter, who was the, the uh, head of the other company, Solera. And um, so each of these genomes were done in 2007. And that's really historically, in my mind, what the turning point was when now we were starting to sequence the genomes of individual people. And it's been from there, if you think about it, that's what, nine years ago, eight years ago, and now we can do one of those genomes overnight for $1,000, so it's just amazing. So this was followed by a number of other projects that NIH funded. After we had one genome, we did the HapMap, the haplotype map. Um, here we were starting to try to figure out what are all the variations on the sequence of the human genome? What makes um, me look different than you, and things like that. And so this was the beginning of collecting a lot of uh, other uh, genomic information. And that ultimately led to uh, another project called the Thousand Genome Project. Let's sequence a thousand genomes and see what they look like. And let's choose groups of people all around the world that represent different ethnicities and so forth. And so that's uh, sort of come to an end of a phase one. It's now more like the 2500 Genome Project. But uh, we now understand a great deal about how the human genome varies and what kind of variants are allowable and what kind of variants are, are not allowable and cause problems and so forth. And then um, another project that started maybe five years ago or so is the Cancer Genome Atlas. The genomes that we're talking about sequencing are your germline, the, the genome that's in all of your cells and that you pass on to your children. But when you get cancer, you have a tumor and each of the cells in that tumor has a genome sort of like yours, but it has some mutations in it, and that's why those cells are growing uncontrollably. And so to understand cancer, the idea is, okay, let's start sequencing tumor genomes and try to figure out what genes the mutations have occurred in and what caused the different cancers, and what is it that all breast cancers have in common that distinguishes them from lung cancers or brain cancers or things like that. So this project was to take tumors of many different types of cancer, 
but for each cancer, sequence the genome, see what are the mutations that occur and what makes that cancer what it is. And so this was a big success because it, it defined for many of the types of cancers exactly where the mutations cause problems in the regulation of cell division and things like that. It also has now become a very powerful diagnostic. This will be one of the first applications of this kind of sequencing in the clinic because now if you are unfortunate enough to have cancer, you go into the oncologist, the oncologist takes a biopsy and starts to try to figure out with a pathologist what type of cancer is it and what could the treatment be. Now they will also sequence the genome of that tumor figure out what genes the mutations are in, and then try to figure out of all of the pharmaceuticals available, which ones could either reverse that or block that mutation from having a, a bad effect. And now we have a more rational kind of cancer treatment, and this is what precision medicine is. You have a, you know, each person has their own particular mutation, their own particular problem, and with, with sequencing and with genomics, now you can try to figure out how to tailor the, so that you're not just guessing and seeing, let's try this first, did that work? Oh, it didn't work, let's try this next. You might be able to get it right in the first place from this. So that's where it's all heading. Um, and, and through this period of time, there's now just a whole menagerie of different sequencing instruments. Here was that original one where I said we had 100 of them, and here's the 454 instrument that, that could do the work of 200 of these, and now there's, there's all these other ones. And, and what we're plotting here, this is the length of the sequence it can do at a, at a time. So sometimes you just get very short little strings of 100 letters. Sometimes you can get 1,000 or a few thousand letters of the genome. And then here's that throughput, how, many, uh, how much sequence can be produced in a, in a unit of time by the instruments. So you can see there are some instruments up here that um, compared to the original one, this is one, two, three, four, five, six, over a million times uh, more powerful than what we did when we did the Human Genome Project. So again, you can see there's a, there's a whole range of things to choose from. And this one, the MinION, I'll just call your attention to, this is sort of like the newest, latest, greatest thing. These are a couple of postdocs in my lab. This is the sequencing instrument right here. It's about the size of a harmonica. And what you do, here they are, here's one of them, here's another one. This is in our lab. Um, you just plug it with a USB cable into a laptop. The laptop provides the power. The sequence that gets produced here goes back into the laptop to get analyzed, and you can kind of see what's going on. These are, these are the different, um, this is the length of sequence that's there, and these are the number of uh, reads, we call them, of each of that sequence. But um, the way it works is, for the technical people in the audience, there are a lot of little pores and it pulls the DNA molecule through those pores, and each of the four bases, each of the four letters in a DNA molecule has a slightly different electric signature as it goes through the pore. And what's measured is that electrical signature, and that's what goes back into the computer and gets converted into a DNA sequence, and then we do things on it. You know, this is like getting pretty close to the tricoder, right? You know, you just hold it up to somebody and you figure out what's wrong with them, like in Star Wars. This is, this is getting close to that. The star, that Star Wars, like Star Trek, this is the Star Trek of sequencing. It's, it's here right now. It's still, I would say, in a beta test phase. We actually do, do projects with it, but it's not ready for prime time yet. But someday you'll have one of these, everybody will get up in the morning, spin in it, have breakfast, plug it in, you know, and you'll see, you know, what's going on in your mouth that day, you know. Okay, so that brings us to the Human Microbiome Project, with, which is really enabled by this sequencing technology, the, the reason it lagged behind. And, and here's the premise, it's not the premise, it's actually here's what the concept is. You're just loaded with microorganisms, you're just full of them, and they are as much a part of you as your own cells and your own genome is, and we need to understand them better in order to know us better. Um, So here's a couple of key words that we need to know. <coughs> microbiome is a term coined by Joshua Lederberg, who was a Nobel Prize winning microbiologist. He was the president of Rockefeller University, now deceased. Um, and in 2001, he defined it as the ecological communities of microorganisms that share our bodies. In other words, you're teeming with microbes. 
they're sharing your body with you. It's not they're just sort of peripheral and passing through. They're really an integral part of it, and that's the microbiome. And in fact, as you'll see, you have different communities of microorganisms in different sites throughout your body. And think of this ecologically. Think of this like um, the, the, our planet, and we have some ecosystems in forests, and we have other ecosystems in lakes, and we have other ecosystems in the ocean, in deserts, in tundra, in the Arctic, all these different ecosystems. Well, think of your body as having a lot of ecosystems of microorganisms in all the different parts of your body. The, aerobic, anaerobic, oily, dry, nutrient-rich, nutrient-poor, all of those give you different communities of microbes. That's the microbiome. He went on to say even more in this, in this little opinion piece he wrote, he said we're a super organism. We are not just us and ourselves, but us is really the microbes too, and it's, it's the human cells and the microbial cells together that makes a super organism. And maybe this is one of the reasons for our evolutionary success is that our microbiome is much richer, much more complex than say an insect or a snake or something like that. And that gives us more capabilities. Uh, the other term is metagenome, which was coined by Joe Handelsman in 1998. So these are relatively recent terms in, in, the, in the, all of these fields, genomics and, and biochemistry and things like that. The microbiome field is the, is the new kid on the block because it's only 10 or 15 years old. <coughs> Joe is a professor at Yale who has been on leave in the Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House um, and um, probably will return after the next election. But um, she's had a tremendous impact on uh, government support for science and in particular for this type of research. But she coined the term metagenome. So if you think of a community that has a lot of different microbes in it, a lot of different bacteria, each of them have their own different genome, just like uh, uh, humans and elephants and giraffes all have different genomes. Well, all those genomes of the microbes in a single community is a metagenome. It's all the different chromosomes, all the different things together. So in our body, we have communities, microbiomes, and they have metagenomes. They have their own genomes that have their own capabilities. If you did a head count of the cells in your body, you've got more microbial cells than you have human cells. So I'm looking out at a sea of microbial communities out here that are sort of held together by a human body framework. Um, uh, they're little. They don't take up a lot of space. If you put them all together, they would weigh about the same amount as your brain and you know, maybe be about that big or something like that. But they're in vast numbers. They just completely outnumber us. And if you do the math and figure out how many microbial genes they have, it's, it's way more than we have. Our human genome is roughly 20,000 genes. And there are millions of microbial genes in, in all of those different species of bacteria and fungi and viruses that we have in our body. So this is the key thing. Um, the genes give us capabilities. They encode for enzymes that degrade things, enzymes that synthesize things. Um, the, they give uh, functions to, back to the bacteria that we carry that allow them to fight off pathogenic bacteria that might infect us from outside. They, they perform many, many functions, and, and the goal of the microbiome projects is to figure out what those functions are. But Instead of having to code all of that functionality in our own genome, which would make it huge, we carry around a microbiome, which provides us with all that other functionality. And like I say, that's what was selected for evolutionarily and gives us the ability to, to eat food that we, that, and, and get energy and, and nutrients out of it or not have to code for things in our own genome and do things with our own genome. Um, that's, that's what the game is. It's a symbiotic relationship. Now, just a, a little perspective on how did we get all the bugs and, and this interrelationship. You have to remember, here's the history of the Earth, you know, four billion years ago, something like that. And um, in terms of biology, here's where the bacterial cells evolved. There are two different types of bacteria in the world. There's bacteria and there's archaebacteria. But they all started way back here, billions of years before we came on. Here's mammals, here's primates, and you know, here's humans way over here. 
And um, through all of the plants and animals that evolved here, there were microorganisms already present, already highly evolved, viewing every new uh, organism that evolved on the planet as another possible niche that they could colonize and get nutrients from. And you know, basically the goal of a bacteria is to make more bacteria. So any place that they can colonize and do that, they will do. So lots of microbiomes evolved over the, over the eons as each of these new, or, and by the time it got out to us, there was now a kind of a sophistication and already a lot of interesting parts that bacteria had developed um, that allowed them to live with all these other types of animals. And so we have this very rich microbiome now that's the result of billions of years of these symbiotic relationships. It's just, it's just part of us. Um, and actually, outside of us, there's, there's bacteria everywhere that are not necessarily the bacteria that colonize us in the air and the water, we're, we're constantly exposed to bacteria. They own the planet. And so um, they even have, you know, they affect the geology of the planet. They affect huge things as well as just little things. So uh, we have our own microbiome. We have our own collection of organisms that are characteristic for us. So these ideas, I'm sure you might have heard the word microbiome before because they seem to be everywhere now. When we, we did the Human Genome Project, and that was kind of an abstract concept, I've got to say. If you tried to explain that to your mother, you, you know, you might get some uh, uh, understanding of what it is. But when you start talking about the microbiome, people get really fired up. They, it's their germs and their, you know, they know why they brush their teeth in the morning and all those other kind of things. So they can really relate to it. So New York Times Magazine has had a lot of uh, articles about the microbiome, uh, The Economist, um, here's the scientific journals, you, you know, our other genome. That means if you take all those genomes of the microbes, you've got this other genome that's doing a lot of stuff for you. Um, our inner ecosystem, we talked a little bit about that. But now we're starting to get all of these books. Of course, there has to be a microbiome diet, right? And actually, there's a lot of microbiome diets here. Honor thy symbionts, a microbiome solution, 10% human. How your body's microbes hold the key to health and happiness. There you go. Um, this one is uh, the power of the gut microbes to heal and protect your brain. So there you have that. And, you know, there's nothing that they don't, that they don't affect one way or the other. Now, what? Is it true? Well, I, what I was about to say is we're a little early for these people to be. But um, what, what is true is, you know, most of the microbes are in your gut. Um, our favorite sample that we study is poop. Um, but just because they're there doesn't mean they're limited to there. They can be excreting um, organic molecules. Um, some of them make neurotransmitters like serotonin, and that gets in your bloodstream, and that goes through your whole body. Um, some of them make, uh, uh, are capable of contributing to the, to the production of nitric oxide, which is a small molecule which, which lowers blood pressure and has other regulatory effects on your physiology. I mean, it, it's not, it would not be a surprise that, you know, the bugs on your gut, but also on your skin and your mouth and everywhere are affecting everything throughout your body. We just don't know the mechanism yet. So it's a little early to say that we know how it happens, but I'm sure that it does. And, you know, in the world of science, Here's the number of publications in scientific journals that have the word microbiome in them. And you can see that's just taken off. Everybody's getting on the bandwagon. Here's the amount of funding from the NIH for microbiome research. This is the last three years. That's going up. This is like half a billion dollars now. So this is huge, as somebody would say. And, and it's, uh, uh, it's here to stay. You know, there's a lot of things that are going to be affected by this. Um, and speaking of huge, um, this is a well-known journal, the Allium. <laughs> the, uh, some of you may know of, of, of the Onion, which is a humor magazine. If you look up Allium in the Wikipedia, you'll see it's a, it's a fancy name for Onion. Um, Trump proposes ban on all microbiome researchers until we know what they are up to. And you can't read the fine prompt here. Don, Donald J. Trump is calling for an immediate ban on all microbiome research, quote, until we can figure out what these guys are up to, unquote. According to Mr. Trump, there are huge sectors of the microbiome community that have a, quote, 
great hatred of American poo. <laughs> so, you know, everything has to have something from the Donald. There are more bacteria in your mouth than there are people on the earth. So this is, you know, we're talking multitudes here when we talk about it. And that's why it can have such a, a, a powerful effect on you because there's so much going on, even though they're little. And um, if you just think about the market potential for microbiome, you know, how, how, how this is going to affect our life. We already have, you know, the oral hygiene industry is huge. Toothpaste, dental floss, mouthwash, skin products, soap. Uh, acne treatments, deodorant, other personal products, probiotics for your gut, all these things, it all has to do with dealing with your microbiome, dealing with the microbes that you carry around with you. This is bacterial phobia or something like that, but these aren't pathogens. This isn't cholera and tuberculosis and syphilis and things like that. These are just your normal bugs that you're carrying around that are doing all of these things that I was telling you, and there's already a huge industry out there to deal with that. Imagine what's going to happen in our lifetimes as we find more and more things and more and more ways to both use bacteria in a useful way and also when things are out of whack and, and products that can, can, can readjust it so our health comes back. So here is uh, in saliva, here's what a, a, one of those communities looks like that we've been talking about. These are all the different genera of bacteria that you find in saliva in a typical experiment. Um, the size of the font shows the abundance. So Streptococcus is, a, is an abundant one. Fusobacterium is abundant one. Vilanella is but, but then there's many um, little ones, uh, minor ones, not necessarily unimportant because they're minor. But you have hundreds of different taxa here. And so this is the challenge. In order to study saliva and to study the microbiome, we have to do something to be able to count all of these at the same time. And most of these have never been cultured. Um, the study of the microbiome up until sequencing came along was just about trying to plate out, spit, and count how many different colonies there were of different types. But if things don't grow, you can't see that it's there. And the um, uh, come to how we deal with that. But, but here, so for example, here's saliva. Here are some of those oral ones. These pie charts, these different colors are, are the major genera that are there. Streptococcus, Vilanella, these ones we looked at. And what you can see that here's the saliva, the gingiva, your gums, your tongue, your tonsils. Um, here's the skin behind your elbow, uh, your gut, the vagina, skin behind your ear where your mom taught you to wash, uh, your nostrils. They all have different communities. They all have different compositions of bacteria. So that's the, you know, it's not a microbiome, it's many microbiomes, just like on the planet, we have many different ecosystems and together it's the biosphere. Well, we're a biosphere in this sense. And we also know that um, here's the life cycle and here are the microbiomes of babies, breastfed, formula fed, then you switch to solid food, the microbiome is changing, probably takes until you get to be three years old or something like that before your microbiomes have kind of stabilized and they're more like what they'll be I I into adulthood. But toddlers and um, adolescents have changing microbiomes. A lot of things can affect it, antibiotics, uh, uh, in parts of the world where there's malnutrition. Um, and then as we get into adults, there's the whole range of microbiomes, healthy people, obese people. I'll show you something about athletes. Uh, and then elderly people also have their microbiomes change. So, this is this new field that we're just documenting all of these things and measuring all these things. We're still in the descriptive phase by, by a long shot, but there's a lot to describe. And it turns out stuff is going on all the time and we need to, we need to understand all of this. So here's the basic experiment. Um, here's one of these communities, saliva or whatever it is, all the different colored shapes are different types of bacteria. Um, and, and, you know, bacteria are not, we, we think of bacteria, they're just bacteria. But um, the bacteria that you've heard of, E. coli, and another bacteria that you've heard of, Staphylococcus, these are in different phyla. And that means they're as different from each other as a fish is from an insect, because they're in different phyla taxonomically. So the bacteria can be quite different from each other. How are we going to describe this given there's some of them are abundant and some of them are rare? How, how do we count what's there? 
So the first thing we do is we just take spit or stool or something and we extract all the DNA from everybody. So we just, as a mixture. And then we use these powerful sequencing techniques, the next generation sequencing that I told you about, and um, analyze everything that's here. And then this is the hard part, get out the uh, computers to then reconstruct what was here from all of those sequences. So because we're doing this by sequencing, we don't have to culture them and we can sample them very deeply even though there's hundreds of different taxa over a wide range of abundances and that's the awesome power of sequencing. That's why microbiome research didn't really take off until recently. It wasn't until we had that first 454 sequencer that we could now do these experiments in the way they needed to be done in order to get useful information out of them. And in fact, the 454 sequencing instrument was the workhorse for, for the beginning of this revolution in microbiome research. So here's some data. If you're just you know, absolutely not into scientific data or anything, you can check out for a few minutes now. But otherwise, let me just show you what it looks like. So this is part of the Human Microbiome Project. These are the uh, a stool samples from about 200 people. And each one of these rows is a different individual. And what we did is we extracted the DNA from each of these, did sequencing, and then made a list of all the organisms that we found in their relative abundances. So this pretty histogram here are different organisms. Here's a little key that you can't read, but you don't really need to. You can just see there's different colors and different people have different, these are the major organisms, the top 20 or so. And then what we did is we took these lists of organisms and their abundances for each person and compared them to each other person, so pairwise. And then you just make a tree like this in order to sort of graphically show who's close to each other. So two individuals who are next to each other means that their two lists are very similar. But this individual and the individual down here have very, very different lists from each other. So that's all we're looking at here. And, and um, here's the message. If you sort of look at how these group, you start here and then there's one group here and then this goes into a group here and a group here. So there's sort of three high level groups of of uh, people, this group, um, what they have in common is this light blue organism, Bacteroides. Um, there's really nothing that is uniform among the other organisms between them. This group obviously has this magenta organism that they're, and that's called Prevotella. And this group, it's um, at a slightly higher taxonomic level. You have to trust me, it's the family that Ruminococcus belongs to, but they also share a taxonomic type of organisms. So not only are you all just a bunch of bacterial communities, but in your gut, some of you are Bacteroides people, and some of you are Prevotella people, and some of you are Ruminococcus people. And we don't know what that means. We tried to correlate it with BMI and ethnicity and um, location and gender and things, and nobody has yet tried to figure out. I suspect it actually doesn't have to do with the host or the diet or something. I think it has to do with, you know, your gut is going to be a good home for certain types of organisms, and those organisms can organize themselves into this way into a community or that way into a community or another way into a community, depending on who ends up winning and being the dominant organism. So it may be totally due to the talking of the bacteria amongst themselves and sharing nutrients and interacting with each other. But we don't know that yet. We're working on that. Okay, what the, so that's bacteria. What about viruses? So here are bacterial viruses, bacteriophages, different parts of the body. And we see, again, characteristic uh, different groups of phages that are there. Phages use bacteria as their host, so not surprisingly um, in the nose, uh, the, the, the bacteria, Propioni bacteria, is the major one, and so its phage turns out to be the major nasal one and so forth. But that's another thing to keep in mind. Those bacterial viruses, there's a, this dynamics between bacterial growth and then they become a good host and, and the virus kills them and then they're, they're knocked down in their numbers and then they come back up again. This is ecology and um, predator-prey relationships and lots of very interesting things like that to be studied. What about human viruses? 
So this is uh, 100 healthy humans, and we look at the viruses. In this case, it's in a stool sample, but we've done it in many body sites. And in the average person, we can find four or five different types of viruses that they're carrying. So, and some people have up to 15 of them. So you're not only bacterial communities, you're all infected. And you think you're healthy, but you're carrying a bunch of viruses around with you too. And we don't know what the viruses are doing. These are like commensal viruses, harmless viruses. It sounds like an oxymoron. Um, here's a bunch of different types of viruses. Here are the 100 people. Here's a virus that almost everybody has. It's a herpes virus. You know, it's known that people carry. And here are other, some other viruses that many people have. Then there are some that only a few people have. So we're trying to comb through this and try to understand what does this tell us. And the viruses are interacting with the host and the bacteria are interacting with the host. But as the virus interacts with the host, it can affect the bacterial interaction with the host. So there's a lot going on here that, that we have yet to learn. OK, let's talk about a little clinical stuff about what this is good for. So those are sort of the tools that we have and sort of the concepts that we apply. Um, this, this is the poster child of microbiome uh, and what it's good for and how you can use it to, to treat disease. Um, Clostridium difficile associated diarrhea. So Clostridium difficile is a bacteria that can be pretty nasty. It's got toxins, it, can, it, it secretes those, it can do bad things to you, can cause diarrhea and other problems. And here is, here is a, in an intestinal uh, microbiome, there might be a few C. diff strains, but there's not enough of them to cause a problem because there's all those other bacteria, the Bacteroides, the Prevotellas, the Ruminococci, that are sort of beating it down and, and keeping it in check. And there's other bacteria that are like this too that you have this story with. Now, you break your leg, you go into the hospital to have it set, and they give you some antibiotics just for protective reasons. You know, it's not like you have an infection or anything, but you're going into the hospital, so it's always safe to give a little antibiotics. Um, what that does, the unintended consequence of that is it may protect you from infections, but it knocks down your microbiome because they're killing all your bacteria. And the thing about C. diff is it's resistant to lots of antibiotics. So when you knock down the, the uh, gut flora, C. diff can now begin to grow and it can be flourish. And so you get what's sometimes called antibiotic associated diarrhea, but also Clostridium difficile associated di diarrhea. And so you have this disease, and, but here's the problem. How do you treat it? Because C. diff is resistant to a lot of antibiotics. So you can't just take an antibiotic and it'll go away. And this is a horrible condition. It's chronic, it can kill you. Um, you have diarrhea all the time, it's worst. And so, uh, you know, how to treat this? So, um, what, was, what is done now, this is the standard of care for treating this, is to take a healthy microbiome and introduce it into the gut so that that grows and it beats down the C. difficile, or this is the model that people think happens, and it cures the diarrhea. Now, where does the healthy microbiome come from? poop from a healthy person. So this is called fecal microbiota transplants, FMT. But this is the standard of care, and, and when you have C. diff-associated diarrhea, you're going to try anything. And so um, the, the, the goal now is to try to figure out just what are the microbes that are the most important ones and to be able to make something synthetic and, and have, them, uh, be, they have that be the treatment. But this is the concept about how to manipulate the microbiome and treat different diseases that are associated with the microbiome, how to correct it. Um, there are a lot of these diseases. These are ecological diseases, if you want to think about them that way. They're not infections from without, not infectious diseases. Um, antibiotic treatment is the thing that changes the environment that allows C. diff to go. Um, when you get a cavity, dental caries, you have a microbiome on your tooth. That's your plaque. That's what you brush your teeth every morning to get rid of. Um, if you eat sugar, the bacteria in that community that can use sugar as a, as a uh, nutrient overgrow, they turn out to be bacteria that secrete acid. And acid causes demineralization of the bone in your tooth, and you get a little hole. So again, you change the environment by sugar, throws the microbiome out of whack, 
you get, a, you get a cavity. So it's another ecological change. Toxic shock syndrome, which was caused by um, superabsorbent tampons, changed the vaginal environment. And if you happen to be carrying a particular strain of Staphylococcus aureus that was making toxins, it caused toxic shock. So this is, this is sort of a concept to carry around. When the microbiome gets out of whack, that can get associated with disease. And there are now many, many diseases that people are very interested as to whether that's what's going on because now you could treat it by changing the microbiome rather than taking medicine or antibiotics or, or things like that. That's the hope. Um, we study a lot of babies in the neonatal intensive care unit. We did a study for 600 or so days and we got every diaper, every poop that went on in there. So babies are in there for five weeks or so and now we could study the development of the microbiome in their gut. And, and babies there, uh, they're premature babies, they can get blood infections. Necrotizing enterocolitis is a horrible inflammation in their gut that can be lethal and comes on very quickly. So because it's their gut, it make it think it's something to do with the microbiome, respiratory distress, many other things. So here's, here's, here's a typical premature baby in the NICU. The first week they're given two different antibiotics just to protect them because their immune system is underdeveloped. They don't have a microbiome to protect them. Give them a couple of antibiotics. But at that point, when you take them off that, they're like a germ-free human because uh, of, the, of the treatment. And the first poop that they have, these are, these are all the different microbes. You can see there's only one or two dominant organisms there. Whoever gets into the gut first finds themselves in heaven because they don't have competition. They have all these nutrients. It's just a great place. And, and with time, this is 40 days or so, with time, there's a bloom, and the other organisms come in. And like I said earlier, it takes about three years for that to get to be um, where uh, adults are. This is breast milk, and this is formula. That affects it, too. So necrotizing enterocolitis, we, we, there's no way to predict it at this point, nor is there a way to treat it that, that's reliable. And it's this terribly serious disease. So here are four different types of bacteria. and the orange are babies who got necrotizing enterocolitis. The green are healthy babies. And so for these four bacteria, we can find differences in their abundance. So this is like the first step in trying to have a diagnostic. Think of all those diapers we had. And if we could measure the bacteria that were in them and figure out, is it like a case or is it like a healthy baby? And maybe even because we have an idea of what a healthy baby's microbiome would be like, you could just take all the premature babies there and give them some kind of probiotic or something to make sure that their gut microbiome is what it should be. And then you wouldn't even necessarily have to do uh, uh, diagnostics. You would just be comfortable knowing that they were protected. So that's, that could be another great moment in microbiome research. This is acne. So we um, took the microbiome from the skin of people who had acne in the, where the lesions were and also in healthy parts of their skin. And there's, there's one bacterium that's the dominant bacteria on your skin, Propionibacterium acnes. And so um, what, you, what you do when you sample the skin is you're not so much wondering whether you're going to get P. acnes or not. You're going to wonder which strain of P. acnes you're going to get. And so these are 10 different strains. And you see these four strains we find equally in healthy skin and acne. Here are five strains that we only find where there's acne skin. We never find it with healthy. They turn out to be releasing a small molecule called porphyrins that causes inflammation and probably has to do with the acne. Here's a strain that we only find in healthy skin. So it means that it doesn't do bad things to your skin, but it may also kill the other strains of P. acne so that the bad guys don't get a chance to do anything. It could be protective, in other words. So you could imagine growing this thing up, putting it in a little cream or something, and putting it on where there's acne and, and being able to reverse it or at least protect against it. So you know every teenager would just love that product. And, and it was even written up in student science, you know, one of those weekly newspapers that, that kids in school get. The Truth About Zits, it's an article about P. acnes and about the, the possibility that that could happen. So another thing that could be coming out of the microbiome project. Okay, so lastly, 
what's the best microbiome you could have? You know, now I'm sure you're all just trying to figure out, I'm going to go back and read those books and figure out exactly what to eat so I can have it. So what is the golden microbiome? So we did, or we're doing an athlete microbiome project. So these are mountain bike racers. Um, and there's sort of two classes here. There's the people who are like Olympic grade. They win every week in the races. And then there's like the weekend warriors who just like to go out there on the bike and be part of the, part of the race and compete. And so we got poop from everybody. Um, uh, we worried a little bit about what the diet would be and the way they described their diet is they were on seafood diet. They were so hungry from training all the time that any time they saw food, they ate it. It didn't matter what it was. So there doesn't seem to be any particular, you know, adhering to the Mediterranean diet or something like that. It's all over the place. Um, and so here's another one of these uh, pictures. The green are, are the uh, professional racers, and the red are just healthy adults from the Human Microbiome Project. And we're comparing their stool samples. And you can see right away that there's one cluster of all the racers, and what stands out with them is this blue, and that's a bacteria called Prevotella. You remember of those three types that healthy people were, there was a small number of people who were Prevotella. Well, about half of the athletes are Prevotellas. And then there's kind of another cluster here that has a, a number of the other healthy adults, and um, uh, we're still trying to figure out what's, what could be dominant there. But then there's a whole bunch of people in here that doesn't have very many athletes. These are just healthy uh, adults. They have a lot of the bacteroides. Um, so there's some difference. There's something about the athlete microbiome that is different than just a healthy person. And you know maybe that's, good, that's what gives them energy and they're disciplined and they're motivated and they have all those good properties that we would like to have um, if only we could get that, that microbiome and put it in a bottle. They also have an archaebacteria, you remember we talked about uh, archaebacteria and bacteria, called Methanobrevibacter smithii. Um, very common in the professional racers. The weekend warriors don't have it so much and the healthy adults don't have it so much. And again, this is, it, it comes from this kingdom of life, the archaebacteria. Here's the other bacteria and here's the eukaryotes, the, the plants and animals. So archaebacteria, there, there are different group, they're a different kingdom, so they have different metabolism. They do things differently. And um, one of the things that they can do is their inputs are things like hydrogen gas, carbon dioxide, acetate, formate, methanol. These are the end products of bacterial uh, metabolism. That's the stuff that a typical bacteria releases. And so in your gut, the bacteria that you have that are, that are helping you um, the end product, what their, what their end, uh, waste products are, are these things. But if you have M. smithii around, it eats that up. And so you get more energy, you get more nutrients, you sort of get more bang for your buck if you have M. smithii around. That's the theory. Um, by, by removing things like hydrogen gas and things like that in your gut too, it helps the other bacteria because that's actually inhibitory for them if it gets up to too high a, an amount. So the concept is that M. smithii uh, is, is doing something more. I don't know why the athletes have it and other people don't, if, what's cause and effect here or anything. But the athletes are very excited. It's a new kind of doping, they think now. <laughs> they can just take M. smithii pills and they'll get a little more energy out of it. Um, you also find M. smithii in, in certain types of obesity. And you know the idea there might be that some people have it and it's doing all of those things, um, producing more energy and more nutrients, but they're couch potatoes and so it just goes right into fat. They don't burn it off the way an athlete does or something like that. So uh, stay tuned, but there'll be, there'll be something in, in this one that ultimately would lead to things that will be a better definition for what the healthy microbiome is. We won't have to do fecal transplants anymore and there might be a lot of other benefits from this too. And this is, you know, we're busily now taking poop and isolating the bacteria out of it, particularly for the uh, athletes. And I kid you not, this is the first plate of isolating from the athletes, golden bacteria, you know, just like you would expect from the golden microbiome. Okay, so uh, the last slide, um, all of this is now, you know, we're in early days of this, but there's already 
been a number of uh, sort of major consortium being formed to now try to figure out how to take this to the next level. What kind of technology needs to be developed so that it's not just a, a research laboratory system, it's something that uh, could be done more widely, what kind of product should come out of this, how to relate the human microbiome to plant microbiomes, animal microbiomes, the environmental microbiome in, in, in uh, uh, soil, in, in lakes and things. So, so we're just at the very beginning of a, of a great adventure, but there's a huge amount that's going to come out of this, I think, a huge amount. And with that, one more, yes. I'll just uh, call attention to all the people in my lab who do all this work. Uh, we have lots of great collaborators and uh, clinicians, and in particular, all of our experiments are, you know, people who join a study, give us samples, and uh, my hat's off to them. Thanks very much.